This is the day of meeting in Christ's name as we embrace one another in care and concern. God is attentive to us and hears our prayers. So let us attest to God's faithfulness to us day by day. Let us pray. O God of all that is, look upon us in our worship this day, giving us a glimpse of the wonders of your love, which come to one and all through Christ, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We add to our prayer list this week, Brad Martin, who is recovering from heart bypass surgery, uh, performed this past Monday. We also pray for Heather Stevenson, who was in an automobile accident in Maine. We continue our prayers for Sona Elizabeth Averill Wyman, for Eric and Bennett Brazy, George O'Brien. We pray for the safety of all American school children, for Alan Dorn, Carol Langlois, 
Riley Stone, Penny Putnam, Bill Young, Cody Pound, George Gray, Lori Ayat, Pastor Hazard, Cindy D'Andrea, Judy Zuliani, Carolyn Montague, Perry Green, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Brooke Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, living with a rare blood disorder, and their parents and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, the people of Ukraine, Afghanistan, Haiti, and Cuba, all prisoners of war, all service women and servicemen, all who are afflicted with and by the virus, all innocents caught up in war, all God's creatures, both great and small. O Creator God, we come before you this day to seek insights into the truths which you have for us as individual believers, for us as a congregation, for us in our wider community, as well as for our nation and the entire human family. Grant unto us the ability to discern your presence in this temporal world, knowing that what we can see was made in all goodness, mercy, and love. Remind us, however, O Lord, that what we can see is temporal and that it is in the unseen that eternity can be glimpsed and that your kingdom is being prepared for our benefit and our eternal joy for which we give you thanks and praise. In this world, O Lord, we ask that where our lives reflect any shallowness, you might grant us spiritual depth, that when our days are filled with fretfulness, that the peace which passes all understanding may become ours, that all instances of irritation might give way to serenity, and that where there is cynicism, that it might be replaced by grace and gratitude. Indeed, O God, grant us grateful hearts for the many good things which surround us, for books which provoke understanding, for music which inspires, for family and friends which comfort, and for the costly heritage of the Church Universal, which channels our energies as we seek to bring to earth the glories of the world to come. We also pray, Heavenly Father, for forgiveness. All too often we have been part of problems rather than solutions, obscuring the vision glorious instead of clarifying your will for your people. We also ask forgiveness, O God, when we have shown our worst, thus discouraging others who are struggling to do their best. May we join them in their sacred labors and thus redeem ourselves. We repent of any thoughtlessness when confronted by others who need our care rather than our neglect, for too often we have failed to share the good news of your presence when others would have welcomed goodwill. We pray that you might make us adequate to the tasks of discipleship and a faithful living, following in the pathways set by your Son in unity with the Spirit. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
Let us listen for the word of God as found in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, the first six verses. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. My late father-in-law, the Reverend Henry G. Wyman, Doctor of Divinity, was the classic workaholic. He was a lot of other things as well, but we'd have to talk about that some other time. Henry Wyman was a big man in more ways than one. He'd fill the whole room as soon as he appeared at the door. In energy, he was boundless, working well into his 90s barely slowing down. In fact, at 92, he had more energy than I had at 22. To be sure, his fall down the snow-slickened marble stairs of the Bangor Public Library slowed him down a bit since he had to walk with a leg brace for the rest of his days. But he never seemed to ever really stop. If he had been a Muslim, no doubt he'd have ended up as a whirling dervish instead of a congregational clergyman. Over the years, Henry had not one, not two, but innumerable retirement parties. Susan and I lost track. He retired from parish ministry, then retired from chaplain's work. He was an industrial chaplain for Anheuser-Busch, then retired from interim ministries, though if truth be told, he retired as an interim a couple of times. 
Well into his 80s, he consulted with small struggling churches. There were plenty of those up in Maine, as well as conducted services in nursing homes. Not all of this work was pro bono. And since, by my, and since my own retirement plans had yet to go into effect, I had once offered Henry the perfect solution. Since I couldn't afford to retire and Henry wouldn't retire, I told him he could just keep working and send me his paychecks. He never took me up on that offer, though he generously paid for me and Susan to accompany him and his wife Sona on a transatlantic cruise. As long as I would serve on board ship as his butler and Susan be her mother's lady in waiting. It was the best busman's holiday I ever experienced. Well, whether we are still working or have retired, we all like our rest, most of us anyway, and we certainly enjoy the extra day that comes our way, even in retirement, to get a change of scenery or to do something that is refreshingly different. That is doubtless one of the secrets of the church's enduring attractiveness over the centuries. Many people find inside the doors of the meeting house a place of rest, of sanctuary, or serenity. Here, even though worship has its own routine, the pace of events is quite different from outside in what is called, perhaps erroneously, the real world. Here we can pause, perhaps to find God and to draw ourselves closer to the ultimate realities of existence. The Meeting House provides both a time and a place for prayer, contemplation, reflection, and meditation. But there is much more to the church than that. If it is a place of refreshment, it is also a place, ideally, of stimulation. Inspiration is not just a passive thing, but moves us, animates us, even propels us along the straight and narrow. In fact, if you look at the scriptural record, traditionally people of faith have been found by God, sought out by our Creator, not just in times of tranquility, but in times and in places of activity and work. Now, we have all heard about those hermits who have gone out into the deserts or found themselves in a cave or retreated into monasteries in order to find the ultimate reality. Many of the great mystics have sought God in contemplation. The saints have made their lives little more than a long, never-ending prayer. Those who would inspire us have often done so not through the tumult and flashiness of the earthquake, wind, and fire, but through the silence of eternity. But there is another story to be told, another path taken, another way to reach God, or rather, to be reached and touched by God. It is often when intent on some useful work and while pursuing a helpful calling that God's voice is heard. And that goes to prove the point that the highest reward for our toil is not what we get for it, but what we become by it. So let us take a bit of time this morning to consider some of the examples from scripture. We heard from the Old Testament book of Exodus this morning that Moses was a shepherd working for his father-in-law. Before that, however, Moses had grown up in the royal palace of Pharaoh under, under the protection of a royal princess. But what was important was not so much Moses's rank, whether exalted or humble. What was important was that God appeared to Moses while Moses was at work, tending the flock of Jethro, and God used Moses as a blessing. Fast forward a few hundred years and we run into a boy named David, who had become Israel's greatest king. David heard the call of God through Samuel the prophet, which came when David was busy tending sheep for his father, Jesse. David's predecessor as king, the warrior Saul, was busy looking for and hunting down his lost goats and cattle, 
when God found him and plucked him from out of nowhere to make him the first king of Israel. And later, Amos the prophet was touched by the divine while he too was tending his flocks. Now let's not get the wrong idea and come to the conclusion that God plays favorites with sheep herders and cattle drivers. After all, these examples I just named came to mixed results. Amos did the best of all, but David counted among his supposed virtues highway robbery and adultery, while Saul succumbed to witchcraft and occultism. Even Moses didn't make it to the promised land because he was found to be wanting. So it is clear that being found by God does not guarantee success. But it does give you a chance that too many others might never have. It gives you an experience that others might never go through. You may end up facing a cross, but just as the Levite sings that it is better to be a doorkeeper for one day in the temple of the Lord than to dwell a thousand years in the tents of wickedness, so too is it better to be touched by God. For even when we stumble, God will be there to uplift us. Others encountered the divine reality through and in their labor. Gideon, who purged Israel of false religion, was found by the angel of the Lord as he was threshing wheat by his family's wine press. Gideon traded his thresher for a trumpet and drove the Philistines from the land. Elisha was busy plowing with 12 yoke of oxen when the prophet Elijah came up to him and threw upon his back his prophetic mantle, symbolizing that as the Spirit of God rests upon an individual as a cloak rests upon one's back, the Spirit of God would now be with Elisha, who would prophesy the divine will to God's people. Nehemiah was told that he would lead his captive people out of exile back to Zion, back to the promised land, to repossess God's gift to Israel. Nehemiah had been waiting upon a pagan king in a heathen court, protecting the monarch from death by poison. Now, if you think that protecting a pagan king from assassination is an odd situation to be found in by God, Think of the disciple Matthew, who was busy extorting money from the poor, given his job as a tax collector. It, matter, it matters little to God, for God can even reach into the worst of situations and transform them. Matthew's future colleagues, James and John, were engaged in the more benign task of mending their nets. And as we heard a few weeks ago, Peter and Andrew were making the morning catch when Christ found them. Mary and Elizabeth were busy keeping house when God spoke to them about bringing two of the most famous cousins into the world. The testimonies of scripture go on and on. But the real question is, what are we doing have we placed ourselves in a situation where God can easily find us? As we celebrate our rest from labor this weekend, whether it be labor in the home or in the marketplace, whether it be the labor of youth or of maturity in retirement, might we be so blessed in our work as to make the discovery that God wants us to be about his business. Amen.
Please join me in our unison communion prayer. Forgiving God, remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup to joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. This we pray in the name of your Son. Amen. For on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. After he blessed it, he broke it to share it with his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he then took the cup to share that as well with his disciples, saying, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Drink you all from this cup and do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray together our unison communion prayer of thanksgiving. Because the broken bread has meant our healing, because the outpoured cup has meant our life, because our common sharing has meant the communion of our souls, and because we have here been graced by your presence, we give you thanks, O God, and pray that our lives be renewed in the life and love of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, 
and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>